This episode originally aired on October 21st, 2022 on the Unethical Patreon. We don't have a client today, but we're in part two of our three and a half part series on Jack the Ripper. Yeah, Bennett Rambo Art, either on Facebook, Instagram. Is that a picture of Jack Lemon smoking a joint? <laughs> no, no, that's uh, that's Putin. But that's funny. I knew it was Putin, but I just thought it was funny because it looks like Jack Lemon. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I've broken you, RJ. I feel like this Jack the Ripper thing is broken you. Are you okay? Am I okay? How do you mean? I mean, I feel like I've broken you. And is that true? Bro, have you broken me? Was that, is that like a win? No, that's not a good thing for me. I don't want that. I don't want to break anyone. <laughs> I'd say let's, let's do, let's do two more two hour episodes and I'll tell you if it's too much. How about that? So yes. Okay. I did break him. That's a fucking loss for me. Okay. <sighs> I just I think I think my thing is spending so much time on and I feel bad I don't want to tell you that uh, I you know like I don't want to diminish the work that you put into it I think I think it's I'm not I'm not doing it I'm just sitting here you know joining in on it Uh, I didn't I didn't put in all the 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 sweat and the effort I I just think it's too much for one topic Uh, I mean I know it's Jack the Ripper and that's like bigger than just about any other thing we've done but okay no that's fair i didn't want to do it either it just happened that way <laughs> i didn't want to do it either. <laughs> oh, it just happened that way it's not like i was like it's just like there's so much shit that you have to talk about otherwise you just miss things you know and i i think that's okay though i mean that's just that's just my personal perspective i no, but i'm scared of getting yelled at by the people that are like there's fucking serious goddamn people about Jack the Ripper. Hey man, hey man, don't be scared. That's hilarious. Ignore them until they get loud enough that they're no, no press is bad press. Like <laughs> let them let them be mad and loud. I don't give. I not to say I don't give a fuck about people listening. I think it's great if they're listening, but like listen in a chill way or um, be, become cannon fodder. I say. <laughs> yeah, if, if we don't vibe with you, you shouldn't be vibing with us. No, I want to. Li- I want to be mad, but I I think that would be that's just funny to me <laughs> like if people are like y'all you forgot this one predi-. like if some of, of all the stuff that you've you've done done the work on um is incredible it's so specific if and mind you if you missed one of these things and someone came up and said exactly what it was and complained that you missed it i would be brutalizing them for like the next three episodes that <laughs> Is the dumbest. I'm secondhand embarrassed for anybody who does that. Okay. I, I just, I look at it like in a different way. Like, sure. Like, yes, that would be what I would do in regular life. But then they go and give you a bunch of one-star reviews and fucking tank your podcast over something like, I didn't say Mary Jane Kelly. I just said Mary Jeanette Kelly. Like, get the fuck out of here with your dumb shit. How many people is it? Because I think like for every one of those, there's got to be like five people who could find out about it unethical is a 3.5 star rating in america because i called a guy a dink well yes but there's a lot of podcasts <laughs> that have mixed reviews for stupid shit like that like that's that what I'm saying. is One... so funny and that's something but i'm sure you guys have talked about it and that's the kind of stuff i don't know i the engagement that i saw on facebook in the aftermath of that though was most everybody else calling those people fucking idiots you know what i mean yeah no, it's true. It's just I, I I have that in my brain where I'm like, some topics I don't give a fuck because they're not highly covered. This is highly covered. And I want to bring something to it. And the thing that we can bring to this isn't much. So I feel like making fun of like all the dumb suspects is the thing because people don't do that. Right. And that's a lot. I know. Well, I, well and, and, here, and here's I guess where the, we, we fork that because like my thing is that like we're we're not actually solving it. You know what I mean? Well, so for that's sure. that's that's what we're bringing to the table is is this sort of sardonic take on it, where it's like, you know, purely irreverent. Like fuck fuck anybody who cares about it is the hard left turn at the end of it. You know what I mean? That's true. That's true. I just uh, yeah, I don't like. I just feel it in you, and I don't like the feeling of RJ being upset over this. <laughs> that's oh, I'm where sorry. this whole I'm not upset. I'm just yeah. It's just it's not it's not as fun for me to to come in. Uh, on the same thing, like Elvis was cool because that was we did we we did like two on those. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different when we're in the middle here. I think I'm just like I'm not as like energized on the topic itself. That's all. But I also feel like a bitchy prima donna saying that because I didn't put in all the research and writing to create the episode. So I'm not trying to take away from you 
and and I'm here. I'm 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 I'm. Uh, no, no, I, I get. Th- I I understand. After a while, you lose this team, but that's what I'm trying to like keep make it. Like this one here, just make it fucking stupid because that's what these are. These are the dumb fucking ones. Like, right. I'm not trying to, as I said, I'm not trying to take away from it. Um, so I, I apologize if I'm being too irreverent. Uh, <laughs> I just, that's, that's where I'm getting my, my, my joy in. That's all. Oh, okay. That's fine. That, whatever. It's just as long as I, I just figured I should ask. No, I appreciate you checking in. So should we run it from the top? Start, no. Start. <laughs> <laughs> no. And leave all of that in. <laughs> uh, that'll be gone. <laughs> An elite team of private detectives. What if balloons are aliens? Maybe that's the key component we're missing. Cover-ups. John's guilty. Mysteries that need to be solved. Maybe Mormons need mountains. Richard, shut up. Last episode, if you guys remember, we did all the murders. All the Jack the Ripper murders, the canonical ones and the non-canonical ones. You you did all the murders, to be clear. Correct. We, we spoke. We all spoke of them. I commented on them and I said, don't, don't stop, but (laughs) get more, get more detail, please. (laughs) That girl getting skinned. Tell me what the color of the (laughs) (laughs) And I realized last episode was way too long. We probably should have split it into two. So we're going to split this up because there are lots of suspects for Jack the Ripper. Like there's over 200 suspects out there i didn't do all 200 don't worry i'm not a fucking maniac (laughs) you're not any more of a maniac than you are yeah exactly i'm not more of a maniac than i already am but i did pick the ones that i found interesting funny stupid uh, anything that kind of stood out as being worthwhile talking about so that's going to mean we're going to do three episodes plus we have that fourth interview so it'll be fucking november is going to be ripper month you know, Halloween's going to be October. Sorry, October, a bit of November. It's going to be Rippers, the Ripper. After that, I'm going to do some dumb ones because I don't feel like researching this deep into anything for a long time. Yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, you should write a you should write a book on all uh, that you know now. I don't know how much you need to write a book. I feel like there's no minimum requirement. I think you can just release a book. Well, if you release like a page, that's not really a book. It's a page. So what's the minimum amount to be considered a book versus like a binder? Exactly. That's my You question. take your entirely unedited 30,000 word, whatever, Google Doc and just publish it on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, but you can just do what they did for the Sherlock Holmes stories and make the pages like this big. So it's like the same amount thick. That's true. You can make it like 100,000 pa- pages of 30,000 words. Think about that. I don't mean, word a page. 30,000 pages. Every page is a word. That'd be fucking annoying. Imagine Besides, if, like you, if you write too few pages, just slap some pictures in there and it's a fucking ch- children's book. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're good to go. And I figure also, since there's 200 fucking uh, suspects, this is Private Dicks. And a lot of the podcasts and things that I read will only outline like the major ones, which are fine. That's fine. But this is Private Dicks. I want to speculate. Like, I, I like that about the show. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to get some shitty, crazy ones, and we'll talk about them uh, that people don't even really talk about uh, as much. So the first episode today that we're going to do is going to be about the weak suspects. The people I found were less probable as actually being the Ripper, but some of them are hilarious. And how people leap of logic to get to these are amazing. Uh, some of them are just like serial killers of the time that they went well if they were serial killing they must be the ripper and it's like what wait what that doesn't have us this not how this works so yeah so less likely ones this this week and then next week we'll do the big boys the the ones people take way more seriously so first suspect of the jack the ripper first guy i got on the docket here is a guy named james thomas sadler he was hanging out with Frances Coles. She was the 25-year-old murder victim that isn't considered a canon- canonical five. She's the last one from 1891. He was hanging out with her the night she got murdered. Coles was the one found stabbed a bunch under the railway archway. I don't know if you guys remember that. She had no post-mortem mutilations, didn't really match the MO of the Ripper, and he was let go by police due to lack of evidence. Sadler was a merchant marine fireman which i didn't know that they had specific fucking sailor firemen dudes that's kind of fun and coles was a prostitute half his age and they were friends uh they've been friends for years they've been hanging out the couple days before her murder they were drinking all day for two days they decided they were going to go for a 
tavern hop. They're going tavern to tavern for like two days, just getting fucking liquor. I don't know how these guys got together. Like, I, I think it was either she, like he had a steady job and stuff. I don't know if she was like enamored by like the guy who could be a stable income in her life. Or if it was just like the old guy who had a sex worker that he called up all the time. I don't know if it's like she liked him or she liked his money. I'm not sure. I tried to figure that out. I was like, did they fall I mean, in love? Oh, wait, that's a good question. Do you have a regular sex worker that you like always go to because you like the tried and true method? Or do you do you switch it up? There's both ki- types of guys, I would assume. I would imagine there's guys that just like variety, spice of life. Some people just like to fucking stay at home every night and watch Netflix. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I don't like you limiting it just to guys. But for anyone that listens to this, if you could comment in the comments or in Patreon and let us know that if you're a <laughs> one hooker kind of person, or if you're a, if you're a roundabout, said- try the try try the the different fish in the sea. Yeah, person. Like, what the fuck did you want me to say? I, well, no, it's just. Funny. Well, however you identify. Do you like mobile? Rick, the feminist over here, like, hey, women fuck whores too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're calling them hookers. Yeah. He, she's, and they's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All of prostitutes. <laughs> hey, I mean, listen, if there's one thing to get canceled for, it's not being inclusive in, in prostitution, 100%. There's only fans for every gender. I've never seen, I've never come across those. That's just me. All right, I'll send you some. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> so yeah, so they've been drinking for two days and the night of her murder, apparently somebody saw them fighting. They were in an argument. I don't know what it was over, but they must've made up because Coles's landlord saw the two of them back at her guest room at around 1.30 a.m. the morning of the murder. Now, according to the landlord... Sadler left the room, came back a couple minutes later, covered in blood. Mm. <laughs> can I, I can I intimate it what the argument may have been? Yeah, please. Okay, so the, the guy's like, "Oi, you can't keep bringing that rope into bed." And she's like, "Well, it's the only way I can fall asleep. <laughs> it's how I'm going to do it." <laughs> yeah, uh, I think she was a little bit higher class. I think she was like, she actually had a guest room. Like, I think she had a room. This Francis Cole. Oh, Quick. okay. All right. Was yeah. it a room or one of the one of the, the coffin beds? Yeah, I think it was the actual room. So I think she was oh, okay. like she was doing well for herself. Yeah, he comes, he leaves and then comes back covered in blood. And then he goes to the landlord covered in blood and goes, like, Can I get back in the room, please? And she's like, No, you fuck. Get get out of here. Go to the hospital if you're covered in blood. That's what the landlord assumed. Not I he just went out and murdered someone. The the assumption was you're hurt, go to the hospital, which I find a very nice way of looking at things in Whitechapel in 1888 or 1891. I don't know. Ooh, I, somebody comes in, comes up to you with blood. Is your first thought that they just killed someone? Probably not. I don't think ever. If you were just seen with a lady friend and then came back by yourself minutes later, I'm gonna go with yeah. I think it's. Murder. I don't think. I, I think my first question is what happened, but I don't think I immediately think, oh, he just killed that lady. Yeah, nowadays, but I'm thinking of Whitechapel. I'm gonna start sending people covered in blood to Rick's house, see how he reacts. Yeah, yeah I mean, it de- actually, okay, okay, I'll tell you what. It depends what door they come to. If they come to the front door, I'm like, oh shit, are you okay? If they come to the back door, I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? How amazing would it be if, like, one of these days, like, I could set it up somehow while, when we're recording? As as we're talking, we just see behind Rick that door open up and a bloody person comes yeah. sauntering out. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I blame it on you guys. He yanks the pistol under his desk off and just <laughs> shoots him dead. I opened that door the other day and the light was on. I must have left it on ever since I opened that for you. <laughs> nice. Nice. You're welcome. Yeah, I yeah. Know. You left it on, I'm sure. Not the... The uh, what was that old story that that small Japanese woman that was living in that man's house for months yeah. and months on end? The light switch is on the outside, so definitely was me. Fair yeah, way. she crawls out from under the couch, <laughs> turns it on, and then goes and crawls underneath there. Once you go to bed, she's she's locked in there, so she can't hit the switch. I got you. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. He asked the landlord to get back in Nicole's room, but the landlord told him to go to the hospital if he's covering that amount of blood. After hearing this. And also finding out that Sadler had sold his knife that night for some tobacco and a shilling, the police arrested Sadler for the murder of Coles. Now, since Coles's neck had been sliced, the police thought for sure that they had caught not only the murder of Cole, but they also thought they closed the whole Jack the Ripper case. Sadler proclaimed his innocence and called upon the Seaman Union to help back him up, which they did. The what? The Seaman's Union. Okay, that's what I thought you said. 
Yeah, you just wanted me to say semen again. No, I, I just wasn't one hundred percent sure. I want to make sure before I bake that into a theory later that uh, I heard that correctly. We okay. have to use. We have to ask for consent before we make people get us horny, Rick. Fair enough. Oh, you were talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, say, say it again. Say it again. Semen. <laughs> yeah, which they did, which I find I, I didn't know that like the semen union would have been that big and they give him a lawyer and everything. And and the police's case fell apart quite easily with a bit of scrutiny. The blood on Sadler's shirt was because he said he was just mugged just after he left Cole's room and he was trying to get cleaned up. It had nothing to do with it wasn't even his blood. It was the assailant. He kicked the shit out of these guys who tried to uh, assault him. And they found the knife. They went looking for the knife that he had sold that night. And it was an old blunt piece of shit knife that wouldn't be able to OJ anyone. Case falls apart. Metro police still looked into Sadler for the rest of the murders because they were like, fuck this guy. He looks suspicious. Let's check him out. Uh, he had an alibi for all the other murders. He was out at sea. So it's pretty hard to, to, to get him for that. So he's not our guy. I don't think uh, he probably did kill Coles. That's what I think. I think he actually fucking murdered that chick, but I don't think the rest. But even though he's not the guy, the media still thought he was and reported it that way anyway. So much so that Sadler, when Sadler entered the courtroom, there was almost a riot. The rabble rousers were calling for Sadler to be lynched. Cops had to beat the crowd back with their billy clubs. Billy clubs. Is that a good like semen? No? All right. Beat their billy clubs. Are you asking if billy clubs turns anybody on? Beat their billy clubs. I don't know. Oh, uh, okay. If billy clubs turns you on, <laughs> down in the comments, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the city's on edge. The media's not helping. He was found not guilty, but later on, he actually sues the newspapers and he wins a shit ton of money. So this is probably one of the better cool. things that happened to him. Yeah. So if you want to get away with murder, join a union. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You want to get away with murder? Uh, in the metaphorical sense, you are correct. <laughs> in the actual literal sense, I don't know if that's true, but... Police union, baby. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Boys in blue. So that's our buddy Sadler. Next suspect that they leaned heavily on was John Pizer. The leather apron. We spoke about him in the first. You guys remember talking about Jack or John Pizer, the prostitute robbing sandal maker. I don't at all, but I will act like I do. For I do, I do remember him, but I just point of clarification: okay. he was robbing female hookers, or he was robbing street walkers, sex workers, the ladies that were on the night. So he'd come gotcha. up to them, and then uh, he was hunted down as a leather apron. Remember, he was in hiding. Everyone thought he was the killer after the first murder, because everyone was like, there's a guy who keeps holding us up and beating the shit out of us. It must be him, right? And he was a Jewish sandal maker, but he didn't really ever make sandals. He'd, all he did at night was just like, hey, lady, want to have sex with me? And then he would like rob them. No, nope, not ringing a bell. I remember the rope thing vividly, though. So yeah, okay. Yeah, well, if we need that to come up again. I got that on lock. It's not, but that's okay. We can still talk about the rope many times. I'm sure we're going to say the fucking workhouses or whatever very soon. But yeah, so he had alibis. Uh, he, he was actually caught two days after the second murder. And then there was more murders that happened after. So it kind of like fell to the wayside, but lots of people still attribute leather apron as being the guy, which I don't think so. I just wanted to mention, I'm not going over details again. If you want to listen, go back to the first episode. Uh, that includes you, RJ. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> fucking idiots. You can't remember nothing. He's it's not a- going to just reiterate a whole episode. Go listen to it. Stupids. <laughs> <laughs> uh alienates the entire fucking listening crew <laughs> audience thanks man <laughs> pal you no, you did by doing four episodes on jack the ripper <laughs> uh fair enough next theory is a guy next suspect is a guy named george hutchinson and he's again the guy i mentioned last week too he was the last guy seen with mary jane kelly uh she was one she went out and asked a guy for a sixpence he was the last guy to ever see her and he was like i don't got any money for you lady he was questioned. He gives police a detailed description of the man that could be Kelly's killer, Mary Kelly's killer. What makes him a potential suspect? Some say he gave his accounts in way too much detail. Like he was giving like the guy was five foot seven and a half inches, curly mustache. Like he had time. He didn't get questioned for three days after the murder. So he had lots of time to think about what he was going to tell the police. It was just way too accurate for a, a person's detail. Here's the, the big lay down with him. So he was the last person to see Kelly hours before death. Uh, he also left London 
uh, to Australia in July 1889, right after the murder of Alice McKenzie, which is one of the non-canonical murders. He left right after, and then the murders kind of stopped, right? I also see accounts that Hutchison was in love with Mary Kelly, and for him to have murdered her or anyone else was unimaginable to everybody else around him. Like, he loved this girl, and everyone said that he was, like, very torn up over this whole thing. So I don't really think that he was the guy... I don't know, for Kelly, at least. I, I Maybe he killed the other ones. Maybe he just loved Kelly. I just, the, from what I see, this guy was a good guy and people just throw him under the bus because he was the last person to see Kelly. Big deal. I kind of think that's a very accurate for a lot of murders. When you see when you're the last person to see them, sure. But I don't think so with this guy, just from what I read. About no, him. no, you're, don't, don't, don't second guess yourself. Nobody who, who loves somebody ever murders them. That never happens for sure. But why murder all the rest of them? That's the, that's the thing. Like, sure. He loved them. Love them all. <laughs> he loved them all, dude. He falls in love easily. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's a serial killer and a serial dater, a serial romantic. All right. All right. Please leave Adam Levine alone. Okay? <laughs> this is timely too, for anyone, anyone listening on the Patreon. <laughs> Just make a reference and then call it timely. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is timely. Did you not see <laughs> you the shit about Adam Levine? It, though. It's not... <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I, I was making the joke about Adam Levine because it doesn't he sing a song about falling in love easily, but then he also just... Oh, maybe he does. I thought you were just referencing something happening. <laughs> no, no, I was referencing, I was referencing <laughs> Adam Levine as a person in general. I thought it was like as if you made like a good quip and you were like, oh, clever, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I apologize. Listen, self-encouragement is all right. I mean, that's true. That's true. I... Next guy, Joseph Barnett. This guy here, we we're talking about Mary Kelly. This guy was Mary Kelly's boyfriend that was hanging out with her during the day before or ex-boyfriend, but he still like hung out with her. He broke up with Mary Kelly because she brought home a, a prostitute person to like, remember their 12 by six room or whatever the fuck it was, or it was a 12 square foot room. Yes. And she brought home one and she's like, I don't want to do this all day, all night. So I'm done. See, I think that's what I remember most is just the horrible living conditions from the last one. Yeah. Cause that, <laughs> that I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. So yeah. So she, he's put it in as a, a suspect because they say that he was trying to get her out of the, the sex work so much. Like he did a lot of stuff to get her out and then she went back into it. So he went in a rage. What he decided to do was go out and kill prostitutes or, or sex workers on the street to scare Mary Kelly into not being a sex worker anymore. So that, that was his whole thing. Like get, go out and kill a bunch of them in a brutal way. And then she will be too scared to go out in the streets anymore. And she wasn't. So when he went and talked to her that day and she was like, I'm still going out there and I'm still making my money. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Joseph. You know, I, I know you don't want me to do this, but this is how we make money. You're not a fish porter anymore. You're not making the money. So somebody has got to make the money. So he loses it. And then, comes back to her room and kills her in the manner that he killed her, skinning her and all that kind of stuff. So nice. that's their theory on him. I guess rage killing like that, that doesn't seem like you do the mutilation. You do, why, why are you taking the uteruses and stuff like that? Where are you putting them? You know, it just doesn't seem like that follows rage kill. This follows more like a, a weird sexual sadist guy who likes to play with guts and shit like that. It doesn't really follow a rage, in my opinion, and lots of other people's opinions. What do you think of that guy? Nothing. I, I don't think anything. He, he did it too. They all did it. That's yeah. all of them did it together. <laughs> I actually think that's a pretty good theory. I, I think all of these were kind of just like lumped together so that they could have one common email or evil that uh... email. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gentlemen, in roughly 100 years and change, there will be a thing invented. It will be called email. We must share one. How do you do that, we ask? <laughs> I killed five girls at gmail.com. You know, statistically speaking, I would say there's probably a high number of emails that are about Jack the Ripper. Oh, yeah. I would imagine. Why not? There's a fucking magazine dedicated to it. Like, there's all sorts of shit. So next guy is a guy named George Chapman. Now, this is where they start. This is where I'm going to start getting into the serial killers that they're just pinning Whitechapel murders onto. This. George Chapman was a Polish serial killer who was executed in London in 1903 for poisoning deaths of three women. So he was a poisoner. First of all, that doesn't match at all. George Chapman wasn't related to Annie Chapman at all. Annie Chapman was one of the murder victims. George Chapman isn't even re his real name. He just picked that name later in life. Uh, his name is very Polish, and I'm sure I'm going to say it wrong. It was Suren 
Klozowski, S E W E R Y N, Suerin, Suerin. I don't know. I'm not Polish. Sewer? The man's name was Sewer? Sewerin. S E W E R Y N. Sewerin. He's Sewerin. He's out there, Sewerin. Sorin? I think it might be Sorin. Sorin, maybe. Whatever it is. It sounds like, I think there's a director named something Sorin. Severus Snape was his name. Exactly. (laughs) As a young man, Chapman, we're going to call him Chapman because that's easier for me. He studied to be a surgeon in Poland where he was in charge of applying leeches and bloodletting. Like they did, they, they got the kids to come in to be like their apprentices. And that was their jobs. Like the fucking 12 to 16 year olds. Like you get to put on the leeches kids. Like, woo. <laughs> he did scrub out of med school though, a couple of years into it, but he did get the knowledge of where all the body parts would have been and how to, like he was studying beside a surgeon. So he had that knowledge. Okay. He immigrated to London at approximately the same time the Ripper's killings began. So there's a plus to him or a minus, I guess. I don't really, maybe it's not a plus, but it's, <laughs> it adds to him being a, a suspect. Uh, he had a job as a barber in the East End of London during the same period as, the, as well. Barbers and surgeons were the same profession back in the day. I came across this. I didn't, this is why barber poles are red and white. I didn't know this is because they would like have their bloody rags just hanging over the edge of their porch. And people would just look for like bloody rags. If they wanted to go to the barber, they would just look for bloody rags on the outside of the fucking building. That's a fucked up thing for humans to keep like carrying on over the years. Well, now it's like lost in translation. It's been so many years since that's been a, the reality, but that's where it came from. Uh, let's go back to the old ways. That'd be sick. <laughs> yeah, just. I just want my barbershop to have a bunch of like bloody fucking like towels from when they like accidentally <laughs> cut off people's ears. <laughs> Fuck it, hang up the ears outside too. Oh, it's from all the surgeries that they're doing in there too. Oh, you got shot. Let's cut off your arm. What? <laughs> <laughs> George was a ladies man according to what I was reading he had a wife in Poland when he immigrated and he married once again once he got to England so uh, he also had four mistresses three of whom he killed so those are the people he killed his mistresses with a substance called tartar and emetic which is basically just like arsenic poisoning when Chapman was found out and arrested by police by a policeman named George Godley Frederick Aberlein, which is like Aberlein or Aberline, I, I've seen it's pronounced two different ways. He was like the guy searching into Jack the Ripper after the murder stopped. So he's a he's a big player in this whole thing. When they caught Chapman, he he, he apparently proclaimed, "We've got Jack the Ripper at last." So he's he thought Chapman was the guy, and it's only because he was interviewing people at the inquest, and he ever interviewed one of Chapman's mistresses named Lucy Badewski. <laughs> Not even kidding. <laughs> Baduski. I like that. Lucy Baduski. It's a great name. It's a fucking sitcom character's name. <laughs> it's like a tertiary character on Seinfeld. For sure. She claimed, she told, she said that Chapman would be out at night for late hours all the time. And then he was a known misogynist. She was talking about how he used to beat her all the time. And he used to beat all his other girlfriends uh, and wives and mistresses. Uh, he had violent tendencies. One time he was so mad at Lucy that he pinned her down uh, on their bed, choking her out. And he only stopped when a customer came into the barber shop to get like a cut or whatever. The shop, like their house in the shop was the same thing, kind of like when we were talking about uh, the Axemen of New Orleans. And then Lucy, when he let her go, finally, she like reached her hand underneath the pillow and found a fucking long ass knife there. Uh, and she was fucking terrified. And then Chapman later that day said, you're lucky that fucking guy came in for a haircut because I was going to cut your goddamn head off. Chapman's description matches a bunch of the killer, like a bunch of the same description. There's 13 different witnesses to seeing Jack the Ripper over the course. He matched the description. So he goes that way. Chapman also disappeared and went to the U.S. in 1891, right after the non-canonical murders ended. And then it was 1893, took the name George Chapman. He took the name because he got with a girl named Annie Chapman which another Annie Chapman, which is the other fucking girl that got killed anyway. So he just took her last name. He's like, my name's George Chapman. Now I just find that funny. I, I don't like that. Like I remember when I went to college, what, my roommate was a Chinese dude, like from China. And his name was like Chang or something. I don't know what the fuck it was, but he's like, my name's Fred. Like, why don't you just tell me your real name, man? Like that's, I, it bugs me. Like I'm too stupid to say your name. Um, Some of them prefer it. And and I think it's it's a part of uh you know I think it depends it's it's contextual not to like give you like a bummer answer <clears throat> but I know I know a couple of people who have like you know like they're like Peter or Barry and that's not you know what I mean 
one this is one comic i know uh he's he's one his name is peter he's very funny peter wong he's got a joke about it that i cannot possibly do justice right now but like the premise of it's funny by itself whereas like his teacher just could not pronounce his name so he's just like peter <laughs> and then he was like nah, he's just peter no and that's what i figure it is but i mean like yeah it gets fair it's fair i guess so because like i would make the effort to try and figure out how to but a lot of people would just be like whatever they're wrong or whatever they like whatever i get that that makes sense yeah i think it's something about like them being like oh cool we have assimilated with that name yeah but also i uh i don't know if you can tell but i'm not a chinese immigrant so i can't really speak for them well good thing you did yeah <laughs> in 2011 robert milne a retired uh metro police directorate of forensic services identified chapman as the most likely culprit in a paper he published Milne used geographical profiling to determine that Chapman was the most likely suspect as he lived close to all the victims. Do you guys uh, hear about geographic profiling before? I, I knew about it, but I didn't understand that that's what they were doing. It's pretty cool how they'll like figure out, they figured out a bunch of serial killers with geographic profiling just because of like the center of where everything's so close to each other. It's not as random as the people what might want it to be, you know? Uh, I thought it was uh, arresting people based on where they're from. <laughs> That's that's just profiling, my friend. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's racial profiling. Or uh, yeah, no, they sprinkled that one on top at the end, RJ. They don't start with that; they just end with it. Gotcha. Yeah, no, it's okay. it's like a it's like an FBI thing they do now, which I, I I found that interesting. The geographic profiling. He lived closest to most of all the victims. He where he worked and where he went. There's a couple guys that get geographic profiled in this too. That they all say he's most likely because of geographic profiling too. So it's not a hundred. It's not a fucking exact science here. So Ripperologists are divided as to whether or not George Chapman is a viable suspect for the Ripper killings for a few reasons. One, serial killers don't typically change their mo. Like I said, it's hard to think that Chapman went from brutal mutilations to poisoning, and only a few years later, there's doubt to whether or not Chapman would have even been able to speak English. At the time of the Ripper killings, um, he's very, very Polish. A lot of people say he didn't even speak English. And a lot of the witnesses say that they're having the Ripper suspect or the people they think were the Ripper were having conversations with the victims prior to them getting murdered in English. So there's that. He also killed three women he knew. So that kind of doesn't go in the M.O. Jack killed a parent strangers. Well, hold on. How do we know they're strangers? That's what I mean. I know who he is. Because they're not really all connected to each other, except for like the sex trade. Like if they were. And, you know, and being murdered by Jack the Ripper. That's true. That's true. Like there's things that make them think there is too. Like one of the bodies was found like yards from a shop, like not very far from a shop at all. I don't know. I, sometimes I find like a lot of these suspects, like I was saying earlier, just get bunched in because they committed another murder. I don't think Aberlene did a bad job either. Like Aberlene fucking did a lot of work to try and find Jack the Ripper. And if he thinks this is the guy, like it's, it could be it. But after all the shit that I read, I don't know. There's other people that are way better uh, looking for the suspect. All right. Next guy's in that guy named Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. Who chuckled at that? I wasn't looking at the screen. It's, it's me. It's Rick. It's, it's me. Yeah, that one, that one yeah. got me. I don't know why. That one just, that fits the. Because uh, that fell as part of the Siemens Union. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's head of the Siemens Union. Yeah, we got we got Doctor Neil Cream. Uh, we got a uh, fella Ben Moist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a different serial killer from the era that they just jam him in there. Uh, he was known as the Lambeth Poisoner, whose method of murder was strychnine. So another poisoner they just said it could be him. Cream was a Canadian. He studied at McGill University before heading to London for his postgraduate training. After he was caught for murdering five women in Canada, the U.S., and England, he was hanged for those crimes in England. Uh, his hangman, James Billington, claimed that Cream's last words were, I am Jack the... but didn't get to finish as his neck was breaking when he was saying it. He's trying to say he was jacking the fuck off. You're, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be pleasantly surprised sounds compelling but there's a lot wrong with the suspect first this is just a rumor no other witnesses or official reports that confirm that his final words were i am jack the crack his neck the big one is that he's in uh he was in an illinois prison for murder in 1888 when the murders took place so i don't think it's possible for him to be in london at the time but ripperologist donald bell speculated that cream had bribed officials and had been let out of prison before his official relief release 
which was 1891, by the way, after his brother bribed officials to commute a sentence. So 1891 is when he actually headed to England. But this fucking guy, Donald Bell, says, no, no, it was 1888. Kareem just got himself a lookalike who sat in his prison cell for him. And his brother went and got that guy taken out. Like, I think his brother would know who the real guy is. Uh, his, his brother was. And another one of Kareem's biographers explains the I am Jack the final words in this way. The biographer says that Kareem was just about to be hanged. And as he stood on the scaffolding, loses all control of his bodily functions and stammered, not I am Jack the, but I am E. Jack. Elating is what he thinks the guy was about to say. Incredible. Yeah. People misheard a jizz line. Very unlikely. He kneels in creams. He stands in creams and he hangs in creams. <laughs> he does it all. <laughs> very unlikely that Dr. Cream was Jack the Ripper, but very likely that Dr. Cream was yelling that he was about to come. His name is Dr. Cream. <laughs> Maybe that's why he killed all those women. That was just like the sad, <laughs> ironic, like affliction. His name is Cream and he just can't stop premature ejaculating. <laughs> and that's just never not funny. So, you know, I mean, they're going to laugh and he's a piece of shit. So he's going to kill. Him. He is definitely on the list of suspects. They're like, my God, some of these fucking guys will make some stretches and this is what these episodes this is, these guys are today so james maybick th this one takes a long time to get there uh <laughs> okay so james unlike maybrick, neil cream yeah <laughs> james maybick was a cotton merchant in liverpool during the time of the murders he was poisoned by someone typically said his wife because she actually did get convicted of the murder she was sentenced to death but that was later commuted to prison for reasons i'm not going to get into uh life in prison she wasn't she didn't actually get hanged she just ended up staying in prison. Maybrook wasn't the suspect in Jack the Ripper case until 1992. Then in 92, Michael Barrett, who was a scrap metal dealer, claims to have a diary that belonged to Maybrook. In this diary, Maybrook confesses to the five canonical murders, as well as two of the non-canon ones. The journal apparently gives descriptions of the murders that only the murderer would have known. And it ends with, Quote, I give my name that all will know of me, so history do tell. What love can do to a gentleman born? Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. So this guy, I have Jack the Ripper's fucking diary. Okay. The provenance of the diary has been debated amongst Ripperologists ever since it entered the scene in 1992. Barrett first claimed he got the 64-page diary from his friend Tony Devereaux in a pub. While drinking with his buddy Tony... Tony tells Barrett that he had a diary that belonged to Jack the Ripper and asked him if he wanted to see it. That very night in the late 80s, I think it was 89, uh, he told Barrett apparently that he could get him a, 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 the diary published and make a ton of money. And it was. It was published a year later. But as soon as you publish something like that, especially in fucking Jack the Ripper stuff, the scrutiny starts coming. So after looking into this, the Ripper all just go crazy. Tony Devereaux died in 1991. And so they couldn't question him. So they, when they go question his family, where the fuck did Tony get this, this book? The family were like, we've never heard of this diary ever. I don't know what you're talking about. So they asked Barrett again, confronting him like, Tony Devereaux never had a diary. Where did you get the diary? His wife chimes in from the back and goes, his wife named Anne, she chimes in stating that she had the diary and it had been in her family for as long as she could remember. And she had given it to Tony to give it to Barrett so he could write a book about it. She didn't want to tell her husband that she was the one who had the book because she was afraid Barrett would ask her father about it. And her father and Barrett were already on uncertain terms. So right off the top, this story sounds fucking hugely made up. All right. Then experts start looking for hard evidence for this fucking diary. So first they looked at, at the pen and paper or the paper and ink, sorry, uh, to see if they were from the proper period. The book was from the Victorian area for sure. Uh, it had 20 pages from the front ripped out though. The ink tests were inconclusive. Three tests were done, three different answers. Some concluded the authenticity, some don't, some are inconclusive. So there's all three. It's all across the spectrum. The handwriting itself was more of a 20th century style rather than a Victorian style. So fuck you, man. And if, if you compare writings that we know are from Maybrick with the writings in the journal, it's clear that the handwriting isn't from the same person. Three years after this book is published in 95, Mer Michael Barrett swore in two separate affidavits that he was the author of the journal. Just, I did, I wrote it. And then it, almost instantaneously right after he, he recants, says, uh, I didn't actually write those. It was my lawyer. I, I didn't agree to that. Hmm. 
Yeah. So Robert Smith, the author of 25 years of the diary of Jack the Ripper, the true facts and current owner of the diary claims to have authenticated the journal, authenticated it not to James Maybrick, but to James Maybrick's brother, Michael Maybrick. Okay. So it's not James, it's Michael. Bruce Robinson, another ripperologist, helped Smith authenticate the book. Robinson started by figuring out the journal's true history. So apparently in 1992, the journal wasn't from his wife. The journal was found under some floorboards at a house named Battle Crease House in Liverpool that was supposedly owned by Maybrick just before his, alt- uh, his untimely demise. Another named house, which I thought you might find is fun, Battle Crease. The electricians were working on the house, so they found it. One of the electricians, Eddie Lyons, found the book. Lyons told Mike Barrett about the book and they both got it published. The same day Mike got the book, he called the publisher saying he had Jack the Ripper's diary and would they be interested in putting it in? So this is how they got it published. This He just didn't want to tell anybody about Lyons because Lyons would have got questions asked him. So he, knew, he told him about a guy that's dead. Just his drunk electrician buddy found it in a house. Uh, Maybrick or Maybrick's brother doesn't sound like a viable suspect, especially when, since Barrett admitted to writing the journal at least once. So the theory's dead. That's what I think. Or is it? Da-da-da. There's another fucking piece of evidence that links Maybrick to the murders. In 1993, a pocket watch was presented as evidence by a different man than Barrett named Albert Johnson. I'm not really sure where he got it, but I think I saw one place that Johnson found the gold-plated watch at a pawn shop. The watch was traced back to Victorian times, so that checks out. The timepiece was created in 1847 or 1848, and it was a common watch for the gentlemen of the time. Now, the the interesting part about the watch is it had engravings within the inside cover with the names J. Maybrick, I am Jack the Ripper, and the initials of the five canon victims all within. They start looking into this watch now, the fucking Ripperologist, like, is this fucking timepiece real? So they get the engravings tested to see if they are forged. Now, this Dr. Stephen Turgoose uh, of the Corrosion and Protection Center at the Manchester Institute of Science and Technology got to study the watch first. He used an electron microscope to try and test the engravings validity. While there's no conclusive evidence to prove that the engravings were or were not a forgery, Dr. Turgus claims that the way the engravings were, it would be very hard to forge. It's You'd have to have very vast scientific knowledge in metallurgy and artificially aging engraving techniques. So the engravings look real. So they get it tested by another guy in 1994 using an electron microscope and another technique called the auger electron spectroscopy. Um, they found that the engravings would have been at least several tens of years of age, which several tens is how they phrased it. I find that fun. Dr. Wells stated that it would be unlikely that anyone would have the skill set needed to implant aged engravings on the watch. So maybe the ad- watch adds credence to the our cotton salesman being Jack the Ripper. I, I don't know what to say about that that one it's like in the middle for me because like the watch sounds real but the fucking book is definitely fake so what do you guys think trash all right yeah didn't have i didn't have a whole lot of thought on that one i was i was trying to there's a lot to unpack there i'm still i'm still thinking about the the crease house (laughs) battle crease yeah very smooth way to cover for not listening because i don't have nearly as good of a backstory i was definitely listening but battle crease threw me off I will say, and I immediately went down a rabbit hole thinking about Battle Crease. Well, now it was it was Battle Crease. I was hearing Battle Creek, and I was like, I don't know, that's not that funny, but it was Crease. I thought I was mishearing it. No, Battle Crease nice. for sure. Nice. <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, that's a shitty one anyway. But it's it's interesting that like fuck, man, people go through lots of links to, to try and like make their story the thing i'm beginning to hate anybody who identifies themselves as the ripperologist i think yeah. that is <laughs> top tier one of the dumbest ways you can spend the precious moments you have on earth <laughs> and not and not even like just researching jack the ripper that's fine as soon as you start giving yourself a name for it though uh, then we have problems i i agree to a point because like man oh man you could have done a lot of things with your life you spent like you wrote a book about this. You made up shit and made it like a book just to like, it's yeah. it's so far off, like in history that it's not really taking advantage of these victims anymore. Like who gives a, f- like it's like a hundred okay. years ago, but it, that's what it is. It's like such exploitation of these fucking, but people. counter, <laughs> but counter about. argument. I know that you said that like, it's just so lame, but like, what if this person wrote this book, made like a decent amount of money and they live off of just talking about Jack the Ripper and they really love doing it and they're like living their best fucking life. Like, sure, they're weird, but 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that's fine. That doesn't mean I respect you. Like, I mean, that's, <laughs> like, good for you. But it's the same thing as, like, a social media influencer. Like, just some bitch pulling her titties out in a bikini to take a pic on, in, like, in Aruba on Instagram. Like, and then getting 75,000 likes and doing an ad for skin cream. Same thing. Ooh, a Jack the Ripper themed OnlyFans. Jack the Ripper skin cream. That's what I kind of uh, thought. Oh, that's Snuff gonna films on subscription. We can do that. <laughs> Francis Tumbledee is the next guy. This is our first American suspect. What's this? Who did these? <laughs> this is the next suspect. His name is Francis Tumbledee. See, this is how you know we live in a fucking simulation because it's like you go so far back in time. It's like they generate a bunch of random words and just fucking start <laughs> stuffing them together because they ran out of names out of old phone books and they just had to keep making shit up. And they're like, uh, the tumbleweed. <laughs> They're like literally trying to type it faster than, than Richard is. He's fucking researching a mile a minute. <laughs> the algorithm's degrading. <laughs> yeah. The, the crease house. Tumbleweed. <laughs> His name is Tumble T. Not much different, but you're correct. Francis Tumble T. He's an American guy. Uh, he was a he was known as the Indian herb doctor. That's what he went by. Uh, he was a snake oil salesman guy, doctor guy. One of those guys that went town to town selling his, his nice. fancy uh, questionable products like Tumble Tea's Pimple Destroyer or Dr. Morse's Indian Root Pills. Uh, this is some of his, his products. He was sick. Doctor, and I say doctor with quotations because I think he just called himself a doctor. Tumble Tea proclaimed himself an expert on French cures for sexual diseases. Wait, what was that first word? French cures. Yeah. Oh, French cures. French cures, French cures for, sex. for sexual diseases. You just get another sexual disease, and then it overlaps <laughs> with the other one, canceling it out. So that's how we. Do I bet it. you that that slaps with some fucking bruschetta, though. Oh. <laughs> I do like how when sounds like it does. You do your French accent. You put like a fake smoking cigarette. So that I know that's how, <laughs> yeah. That's how you turn it on. That's great. Yeah, that's how you visualize the French <laughs> aspect of it. I can do. I can do the accent all, I, all that I want, but I need to have the, <laughs> the nice the puff puff. Yeah, he's the, that guy. Like, literally, what you think of when you think of the door-to-door -door or the town-to-town -town salesman guy, he's that. He, like, people used to say that he dressed, like, in a circus outfit. That's how they described it. So he would just dress fucked up, bring a bunch of fucking boxes of probably just literally, like, water with some sort of ginger in it or something and be like, I could cure all your ales. I was thinking of the cowardly little uh, old butterball guy from Red Dead Redemption, the first one. Yeah, I haven't played those games. Oh, man. But yeah, probably. He's a funny character. Probably. He wasn't known as a violent guy, but he was linked to the death of one of his patients. He was never prosecuted for that, but I'm sure it's like, I could cure your venereal disease. Just take this. And then they died of whatever he gave them. I'm sure that's how it happened. Uh, this guy was full of shit, too, not just, like, in his products, but, like, he would go around telling tall tales. He told a story once that he met Abraham Lincoln. Uh, like, I, you tell that, that was one of his famous stories. I met Abraham Lincoln. He was a good guy, which bit him in the ass later on in life because when Lincoln was assassinated, Tumblety was arrested for alleged complicity in the assassination of the president. Uh, Tumblety was accused of being friends with David Harold. Harold? Uh, I guess that guy was arrested with John Wilkes Booth. I don't know. I don't know American history that well. That's not a thing that we would know either. I, I, know. Just, I found it funny that you like had to defend your research assertion after you just went fucking like 15 miles deep on this guy. Hey, remember, he's afraid of the haters. As soon as he gets one thing wrong about John Wilkes Booth, we're going to be like, what? <laughs> what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> I love John Wilkes Booth loyalists. If you're a John Wilkes yeah. Booth loyalist, drop something in the comments. <laughs> Is that your new thing? Drop shit in the comments? <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for somebody to kind of like combine them all together and just like drop one insane comment. I, that I, I do want to see what some of these comments that he's suggesting people to drop would say. <laughs> I've never heard of a John Wilkes Booth loyalist, so that, that alone would be interesting. I don't know. Maybe you guys knew about that. I don't know. I don't know anything about America. I just fucking read up that's weird it's kind of rude of you i know everything about canada you think I, since we've been friends you would learn everything there is to know about our I know. Country, my fault like we did my fault in inconsiderate of me i know yeah so he he was eventually let go for that but i mean this is the kind of shit this guy got into like tall tales bullshit all around wherever he went uh although not violent tumble d was a huge misogynist and used to denounce all women 
He hated sex workers the most. He used to say that all over the place. I hate sex workers. And he blamed his hate for women and sex workers in particular on his failed marriage to a sex worker. Hmm. One of the famous Tumblety legends is that at an all-male dinner party, he had displayed his collection of uteruses preserved in jars. Proudly boasted to his guests that they came from every class of women. In May of 1888, hmm. Tumblety made his way to... Do you think that, like, because you said he displayed them at a dinner party, was it more like, hey, look at these? Or was it like, sort of like the carving stations at a buffet and he was like serving them, the uteruses, <laughs> the uteri? Uh, the uter- uteri, I think that's multiple of, yeah. Uh, apparently he used to have them in a <clears> study and he just like had a party and he brought them all out, like, look at this one. This is from a rich lady. Look at this one. This is from a poor lady. Do you think there were so many potential suspects... Because the police just cast a very wide net? Or do you think there were so many suspects because everybody hated women back then and anyone could have just been fucking killing them? Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Because it sounds like a lot of these suspects had an, had an issue with just women writ large. I sure. just fucking said that the other day. This this guy is not a guy. It's guys. What is Who is Jack the Ripper? Yeah. Men. It was more of like a community <laughs> thing. Hey, I'm going to kill a woman tonight. Who wants to join? Hey, I'll join. Get me, me. I can't. I'm too tired from killing women earlier. <laughs> it's pretty easy to surgically remove body parts when you have 15 men holding one woman open. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We act like dudes don't just fucking love almost cutting women's heads off. Yeah. That is like... No, it's true. Because that's the other thing. It's like how much of the fucking articles that are actually written up on it were accurate. You know what I mean? No. Or how much of it was sensational. There's a whole thing called yellow journalism back then that was like, take a thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, back then? <laughs> no, but, uh, but like that's where it started is in England back in those days. And it still continues to this day. But I mean, yep. Tumblety made his way to London in 1888 to peddle his wares. In November 1888, the 55-year-old Tumblety was arrested in London for gross indecency. Gross indecency in London in 1888 was code for having gay sex. Incredible. So while awaiting trial, Tumblety was granted bail, which he posted. And then he fled the country via France back to America because he heard rumblings of the police starting to point the finger at him to as being the Jack the Ripper. I love how he flaunted disembodied women's genitalia or reproductive organs and uh and they were like this guy's all right and then as soon as he he fucked the guy yeah. <laughs> they turn on him it's true though and uh, that's what i say like why do you think uh why did they think this was the guy maybe it's the uteruses maybe it's the personality and skill set he claimed to have maybe he hated women or maybe it's because he's gay probably the gay one yeah but it's just so funny because like what's like the ultimate rejection of women like it's it's not even having their jarred uterus <laughs> it's 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 fucking a guy <laughs> so you think you think all those misogynists would be on board with him like yeah pal fuck women or actually don't that's <laughs> Police in America, like Scotland Yard called America, said, hey, this fuckhead le- left. Gross indecency was just a, a minor crime back, like minor enough where they're not going to chase him to America and get him fucking sent back to London for it. But they called him and they said, they called the American police and they're like, hey, this guy probably did the Jack the Ripper stuff. So watch him. The American police start to follow him and they see no indication that Tumble T was involved in anything. So they dropped it. Scotland Yard eventually did drop the accusations as well because there was another murder that happened while Tumble T was in America. It's one of the non-canon ones. So he's come back around as maybe being a fucking uh, suspect these days. But back then they dropped it because there was another murder. But I don't think, I, I just, he obviously didn't do it. But I mean, he's fun to talk about the snake oil salesman. They think like they were really digging. Who could it be? The snake oil guy. That guy fucking, that didn't cure my syphilis at all. Let's get him. Weird one to jump to. Why? Everybody had syphilis back then. That was like the big problem. Yeah. Also, he was gay. What bigger sin could you? <laughs> of course he's evil. <laughs> he had sex with a man. As a man. That's that's not going to bode well for the women we hate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next guy is a guy named William Henry Berry. Burry. I'm not sure how to say that one. Uh, in 1889, a 29-year-old William Henry Burry strangled his ex-sex worker wife with a rope, stabbed her dead body with a penknife, and hid her corpse in a box in, their, in his room. In their room, I guess. The stabbings were grotesque, but nothing in comparison to the Ripper murders. Not mutilation, just fucking rage. 
Burry was violent towards his wife on a prior occasions. A few days after the murder, Barry presents himself to the police and claims his wife committed suicide. So she strangled herself and stabbed herself and locked herself in a box before dying. <laughs> yeah, bitches be crazy. <laughs> she had a lot of willpower. I mean, that's why he had to hit her. So, yes. I mean, it kind of checks out. Exactly. If I didn't think of what she could have done, she was a monster. Yeah, then he then he uh, was obviously tried for that murder and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Just before his hanging, he actually confesses to killing his wife. So all's well. Not oh, he had everyone fooled too. Yeah, I know. They, they almost got it. He almost, if it wasn't for that box, I don't know what the fuck. But the press hears mm-hmm. about this guy, okay? And they get a hold of the details of the murder and they immediately start calling Barry Jack the Ripper. They're like, they claimed he killed his wife because he found out his rippering. She found out about his rippering. And she was going to go tell the authorities. So he went and fucking murdered her up like that. Barry denied that right into his death. And after investigation, the police cleared him as a suspect of the Ripper. But that doesn't change the fact that Ripperologists and historians and authors have built upon these articles they're reading and keeping Barry as a pseudo suspect for years. A few officers looking into the Ripper case decades later, like in the 1930s, point a finger at Barry but they were just going off of the the media stories of the time. I don't think this guy's a fucking even close to a ripper suspect, but I mean, why not? The media said it. It must be true. It's just nothing changes. It's it's so crazy to me these like the media just can like influence so much even in later years, like 30, 40 years later. You know, it's kind of why I brought that one up. It's not even like 50 years later, you know, it's not even true but i mean it was in the paper so it must be true yeah all right this next guy is this guy's the funnest one out of all well he's not the funnest one he's my favorite one out of all these there's some more fun ones his name is frederick bailey deeming and it's our australian connection today because people from all over the world have been fucking claimed to be jack the ripper and australian (laughs) so that's why we know it doesn't even it's it's not real because he didn't exist Mm -hmm. so this theory is put together by a guy named mike koval 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 spent many years going over old files at Scotland Yard and at Australia's home office to put this together. Deeming's name was actually bantered around by Scotland Yard during the time. And so Koval starts looking into this guy. How come we have never heard of him? Let's look into him. So let's see what he came up with. So Frederick Bailey Deeming, or Mad Fred, as he was called near the end of his life, was an absolute maniac. He was the fourth child of 10 and he had a troubled childhood. His older brother, Edward, said, Frederick was never a favorite of my father's. He seemed to have taken a dislike to him from birth. Frederick was beaten relentlessly by his father all the time. Not all the other kids, just Frederick. (laughs) So even at a young age, this guy gets fucked. I thought you said beaten, not fucked. Same thing, right? How do you do it? (laughs) Oh, that's true. Uh, Because when you fuck yourself, you're beating. So you can understand Yeah, so Deeming started, got into the workforce early at the age of 12. He became a plumber's apprentice to make money for the household. And he also had an obsession with knives, which he started to make his own and sell to sailors as a side hustle. So when Deeming was a teen, he called the police because he apparently found a dead woman at his doorstep. Her throat was slashed, but I'm not sure the direction of the slash for anybody who's going to ask that question. Do you even do research? No. Ridiculous. Yeah, no, it's fucked. According to the detective who worked the case, Charles Marshall, he observed Fred as, quote, excited by his grisly find. So he liked the murder, even as a young guy. Later in life, he bragged that by 18, he had seen more of life than most ever seen. Uh, I had killed a man, too. It was partly an accident, but it changed my life. So maybe he killed that fucking lady. I don't know. Partly an accident? Yeah, I don't know how you partly an accident. Like, it's either an accident or not an accident. It's not like partly an accident. Unless they were like, half dead and you just like put them out of the misery or something i guess i don't know they weren't gonna survive i don't know Hmm. fred wanted out of his house his mom died at 15 so by 16 he becomes a sailor and he just gets on boats just to avoid his father's beatings now living out at sea is where frederick deeming's life was immeasurably changed and he basically became a thief from port to port fred was a redhead he always had a giant red mustache that flopped over his mouth so that really just takes away from the whole thing nobody ever talked about a redhead in the Uh, jack the ripper thing but i just wanted to mention he was redhead he would always dress fancifully as if he were going to some sort of celebration he also wore tons of stolen jewelry he was always talking very loudly taking over every room that he went into he was also into the occult and the supernatural deeming also once claimed that he had seen his mother's ghost floating outside of his window more than one time he said that i'm beginning to understand why his father beat the shit out of him this sounds like the most annoying (laughs) 
<laughs> dude ever like <laughs> i was waiting for it i was like let's make him annoying yeah. <laughs> and he's australian yeah well he's not he's from ah. he moved to australia later so it's like our australian connect ah, right. thing to australia. i thought it was just like crikey father look at it, it's mama's ghost just floating around <laughs> outside the fucking window get over here you little fuck bam, yeah. bam, bam. Like, this is the fourth fucking time you said that today <laughs> Just starts beating him with a didgeridoo. Yeah. I, I also want to mention that this guy here apparently had seizures. Uh, he apparently spent a bunch of time in hospitals in 1878 for having dozens of seizures. So that could probably be part of why he's seeing ghosts and shit too. Just saying. On mm-hmm. his on his adventures, he would frequently return to port in England and visit his father and siblings. Once while back in England on one of his shore leaves, he meets his first wife, Mary James. He and Mary or Murray would eventually have four kids. Sick of the sailor life and with his wife pregnant with their second child, Deeming gets on a ship to start a new landlocked life in Australia. So in 1881 is when he becomes Australian. The couple's plan was that Marie would move and meet him in Sydney the next year, children in tow. So he would get a job and then she would get there once he gets all set up. And he did. He got a job as a gas fitter, but he also moonlit as a thief. Can't get rid of that in him. Uh, He was stealing brass fittings from his employer and he was caught and spent six weeks in prison in Sydney. His wife made it to Sydney by the time he was serving time in jail. While he was in Australia, the couple had their last two children. So he had a couple Aussie children. Deeming had a partner in crime in Sydney. Her name was Ava Grant. Uh, Grant had died after falling from her bedroom window after having an argument with Frederick, Mad Fred. I thought you were going to say bed and not bedroom window for a minute. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I got real excited. Um, (laughs) Because that is that would be a hell of a way to go. You just fall out of bed. Just fall out of bed, yeah. <laughs> and die, yeah. It, that kills you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh. I had a friend die. She slipped in the bathtub, so that you could die from a short edge. But I guess a bathtub would has a hard fucking edge. Yeah, yeah, but that's like like it's not about a bathtub. Like that's like tragic because you know like that that is innocuous. You know what I mean? It's seemingly, but it is dangerous. We've all slipped in the For tub. Sure. How many people have actually fallen that's out true. of bed? That's true. There's a whole kid song about it, right? Yeah, but like that's that's why it's like one of those strange things to like warn people about. Like, you know what I mean? Bumped his head and woke his head and couldn't wake up in the morning. Like, there's a whole song about people dying from falling out of the bed. Wait, that wasn't falling out of the bed though, was it? I forget what it. I forget the first part of it. Yeah. Well, regardless, I I don't know anybody that's died that way. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, so she she died. He just got out of jail. She died after having an argument with him. And he goes, I'm getting the fuck out of Australia. Uh, police can't interrogate me if I'm gone. He didn't really want to go back to jail, so he left. It, by, this is 1887. And he said they're heading to South Africa to start a new life there. So he and his wife, his wife was actually super pumped to get out of fucking Australia because yeah. he would just bang every sex worker he could and he didn't even care he didn't even hide, try to hide <laughs> he didn't even try to hide it she was pissed he, nice. he would come home like he would give her a bunch of stolen jewelry like all these sex workers a bunch of stolen jewelry give her shit didn't even give a shit awesome in south africa is a good move because they sound so similar yeah why <laughs> they they have very similar sounding accents oh, you mean, oh first, yeah, yeah. like I mean the accent i thought you meant like the culture in general i was like i don't know oh n- n- well i don't know i don't know what australia is completely like i assume it's similar to our countries and not so much the the nightmare paranoia crime ridden slash uh <laughs> fucking super hyper racist insanity that's going on down there for sure in south africa uh, i know it's crazy like fucking gated communities anyways i don't even got to get in south africa or- yeah no they they literally all think a race war is like imminent yeah it's it's crazy it's scary there's a whole side note with the blade runner guy that's a funny story ever like the guy who like went in the olympics with his two legs gone that guy that from south africa that oh my god yeah pistorius yeah. isn't that his name killed his wife but like the funny part about that story is like witnesses heard screaming like from his room and he's like i didn't do it that was my scream so he like claims he screams like a woman <laughs> like okay mm-hmm. the story is <laughs> you know it'd be cool if his, his defense lawyer at the trial was like uh yeah mr pistorius boo <laughs> and then he's ah! <laughs> the defense rests its case <laughs> if the scream is lit you must acquit anyways um <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah so deeming started using aliases because he started getting scared deeming family never made it to south africa though because on the boat well, on their way there, Deeming was caught trying to swindle some of the passengers. So the captain said, fuck this guy and your family. So him and his four kids and his wife, they all got kicked off the boat and left on a, like a little island <laughs> just in the middle of nowhere. They actually did. They got picked up like weeks later, but they all just survive on a fucking little island and got brought to South Africa. But they didn't stay there long. The only time, the only length of time they stayed there was just long enough for Deeming to get syphilis from a sex worker while there. I also read that Deeming was scanning people when he left Africa. He had over 10,000 pounds worth of stuff in early 1888. That's a lot of stuff. After he contracted syphilis, Deeming said he hated women and told police later that he was looking for the sex worker that gave him the syphilis so he could murder her himself. I want to kill this chick. I'm looking for her. Police of the time claimed that Deeming was active in Cape Town during 1888 and 1889. But it's like murky to see, like, I don't think 1888, 89 is when he should have been in London if he was killing people. And it's murky. I can't figure out what he was doing if he was there. But it seems more likely that he was in South Africa at the time, because this is the story he comes back to London with. He says when he got back to England, he's the stories go that he had a lion cub by his side that he claimed he rescued after killing its parents with his bare hands. So was he just in fucking uh, Cape Town raping and pillaging there and stealing over there? Or was he killing lions with his bare hands and going back to London? I'm going to go with he's probably still in Cape Town, but people put him up. It's, it's murky to see, so maybe he was there. Let's go with the assumption he did go back to London and he did do the murders. Let's just say he was there for the murders during the time. I kind of want to, we have to keep talking about later in his life so you can understand why he's a suspect. So November 1889, Deeming's back on a ship heading back to South Africa. Uh, side note, 1889, November 1889 is both the last canonical murders done. So he leaves during the exact perfect timing. He's going by an alias. He's going by a, a guy named Harry Lawson. Says he's from Australia. He's a sheep farmer. And as Lawson, his wife's uh, still, his wife, he leaves in, in London, by the way, and he goes to South Africa. But as Lawson, he attracts his landlady's daughter named Helen Matheson. He marries her while still married to Marie. So he's got two wives now. Marie finds out about the marriage and Deeming tries to pay her off with several thousand pounds. He says, just leave me alone. Here's some money. Deeming tells her he's going back to South America and he'll call her once he gets settled. Deeming dumps his new wife, Helen, and gets on a boat heading for Montevideo. So he doesn't even like bring this other chick. He says, fuck both of you. On his way, he tries to swindle a jeweler and he gets caught. And this time, instead of just getting dropped off on an island, they turn him back and send him to England to go back to jail. So in 1880, 1891, he's released from jail and heads to a small town called Rainhill, which is near Liverpool. He settles in a hotel using the name Albert Williams, so another alias. And then he claims that he's a senior army official. He's just retiring now. And then here he falls in love with another lady, a widowed shopkeeper's daughter named Emily Mather. He's still married to Marie. Uh, he marries her again. So a woman shows up to his hotel room while he's there with his new wife named Emily uh, in Rainville, most likely his wife. But he tells the hotel staff that this is his sister and her kids and they would be gone soon. So shortly after the departure of his real wife, Deeming complains that the drains in his kitchen weren't working properly. And he offers the hotel people like the hotel manager that he'll fix them. Just let me fix them. I'll fix them for you. So he fixes the, the kitchen. And then he gets on, he just fucks off. As soon as he fixes it, he leaves, he gets on a ship, heads back to Australia. And he brings his new wife, Emily Mather, with him. They get to Australia on December 15th, 1891. He rents a house called Dinham Villa, which is another named house. Only nine days after his arrival in Australia on Christmas Eve, Deeming murders Mather and buries her body under the hearthstone of one of the bedrooms, covering her body in cement. I don't know why, probably just because he's a piece of shit. He'd paid a bunch of months in advance at this villa, but as soon as the cement hardened, he left. So March uh, 1892, when it's clear Deeming wasn't coming back, the landlord starts to rent out the villa again. The new tenant claims that she smelt a disagreeable smell in the second bedroom. It was so bad that they found themselves barely able to breathe. So the police were called and they found Mather's body in the dried cement. Her skull had multiple fractures from a battle axe and her throat had been slit. I'm not sure which wound killed her, but they were both pretty fucking bad. They have drawings of them. I'm sorry. Did you say a battle axe? Battle axe. Yes. What? Uh, how? He smoked her in the head with a battle axe. I don't know. What do you mean? How? He got it from f- battle. This guy's a pirate. 
Like this guy literally he has axes and shit. He's a fucking psycho. That Absolutely. just does not like I don't care. I mean, maybe like you told me this happened in the 1500s. I'm like, okay, battle axe, everyday household item. But 300 years later, yeah, I got a buddy named Steve who's got like four battle axes. I think we're, I think there's, yeah, I was gonna say, you don't have a battle axe. <laughs> I don't. I got friends who like got katanas. Like, what do you have that for? I don't have a non battle axe. <laughs> I got a bunch of axes. I live in the bush though. Oh, almost right away, as soon as the media hears about this, they get guess what they do. This is my Whitechapel murder. <laughs> so, like, they, they automatically just say brutal. Axe, slit throat, must be Jack the Ripper. So the police were on Deeming's tail pretty quickly because he was such a character and left an impression with his jewelry and fucking weird celebration clothes. And then when they spoke with Mather's family in England, they knew that Mr. Williams was actually, in fact, Deeming. So he fled again by boat, this time with his alias, a new alias, Baron Swanston. Swanston was an engineer. All right. And then on the ship that he was sailing away with. He found an 18, a 19 year old woman named Kate Rosefell. And he asked her to marry him the day after he met her. And she said, yes, why wouldn't you? You met an engineer. Yeah. Oh, back then that was auto Mary. After talking to a guy on a day in a boat. I don't know. Did he kill her with a morning star? <laughs> yeah. So they, she, she says yes. And they head to a small mining town. Uh, in Southern Cross. The police investigation led them to find that he'd been auctioning off, like Deeming had been auctioning off various household goods in Melbourne and followed his trail to Southern Cross. They catch him about a year after the they found the body of his second wife uh, after many swindles and misadventures with his new wife. On his person, when they arrested him, they found a dagger, five pocket knives, four razors, an axe and a black cloak, like the fucking Jack the Ripper kill kit. Jesus, but like then, like a a long bow, a short bow, some throwing <laughs> stars. Yeah. Fucking one of those, one of those ones that you you, you put through like your fingers. The, the those oh. like stiletto looking knives. What are they? Size. Size. Yeah, yeah. five of those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's just funny that they describe, they have pictures, like drawings, renditions of all the knives that he had. It's kind of fun. When they arrest him, this is about the time when investigators in London found the decomposing bodies of Deeming's first wife and four children under the floorboards at the villa he had been staying with his second wife. They all had their throat slit from left to right, including the four kids who were aged 18 months all the way up to nine years. Maybe all their throats were slit at the same time with, with a really long dragon and bone greatsword <laughs> from Skyrim. <laughs> He just, everyone stand there. Don't move. He played them all in a row. Daddy's mad. Don't move. Yeah, I crafted this this morning. <laughs> My smithing skill is insane. Hoorah, hoo. <laughs> Deeming was taken back to Melbourne for trial. Alfred Deakin, who was later prime minister of Australia, was his lawyer. Alfred Deakin was an interesting character. He's really into the occult, and apparently he claimed to have hypnotic powers and can control others using mental commands. This is who was in charge of Australia for a while. Patty Deacon, his wife, also was a spiritualist, claimed she could speak to ghosts. So the trial was full of spiritualistic stuff like that. Like the trial was awesome. The trial was so packed, you needed a ticket to enter. Uh, Deacon argued in court that Deeming's dead mother's ghost used to wake Deeming up at night and demanded that he killed all the women he loved. That did not work. And much to the chagrin of Australia's future prime minister, Deeming was convicted and executed by hanging at Melbourne Goal in May 23rd, 1892. 10,000 people partied at, on the streets after Deeming was hanged. So he's a famous murderer of the time. Now, apparently on death row, Deeming confessed to being Jack the Ripper. No. <laughs> he, maybe, like, maybe he was. I just think he was like, fuck it. I'm going to, if I'm going to be famous, I'm taking it all. There's like similarities, like brutality, but like killing stop when he leaves London. He knew Catherine Eddowes one of the victims he like he, he banged her a couple times apparently so that's something with a with a uh, a warhammer yeah he got her with a warhammer for sure i don't know just because throats are slashed doesn't mean you're the same killer like he killed the ghetto out of having a family uh, demon killed i don't think he killed just for like sexual i like the fucking feeling of guts on my hands and i'm gonna steal a body part he killed because he liked the feeling of medieval weaponry in his hands <laughs> yeah i guess so <laughs> And then he hated sex workers because of STDs. Sure. 
but like that's like the reasoning people give for deeming but like why kill your wife if that's the only reasoning for killing and you're killing your wife and shit then it's two different mo's it just gets weird it gets too complicated for this guy to actually no 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 no, 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 no. see see he, he fucks the the sex workers and they gave him a venereal disease and he's like ah you bitch i hate you for this venereal disease and then he he fucks his wife and gives her a venereal disease and he's ah. like ah you bitch i hate this fucking venereal disease and you know does it with like a fucking mace or a cat of nine tails whatever he can get his hands on uh, i didn't even think of that because obviously he's giving all these women std as soon as they got an std must you must die yeah that's fair yep that's fair likelihood of our buddy mad fred i'm gonna go with the timeline's way too fucked up in reality it's too hard to fucking figure out if he was actually there or not but if he was there he could have done it i'm gonna get, give him a could have because he liked medieval weaponry okay. and hate hookers. But did he? I don't think cool. so. Yeah. I don't know. I'm happy to move on from him. I'm out of medieval weapons to, to name drop. Okay. So. Perfect. You got crossbow in there? Yeah. Chain, uh, Morningstar? I didn't do crossbow. I said, yeah, I said Morningstar. Okay. Okay. I mean, I can go through them if you want to. No, but... no, it's all good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Mace. Mace. All right. Next. Carl Fagenbaum is next suspect. Uh, he's a very fringe suspect. He's a German sailor who was executed in, in New York Sing Sing prison in 1894 for cutting the throat of a woman named Juliana Hoffman. He was caught red-handed by the Hoffman's son, who Fagenbaum didn't realize was sleeping in the room when he began stabbing her in the neck. Uh, at the time of his execution, he was 54 years old. Hoffman was his innkeeper. She rented him the room for the night, so he just didn't want to pay the fee for the night, so he stabbed her in the throat. After his execution, though... His lawyer, William Sandford Lawton, felt his attorney-client privilege was over. So Lawton told the press that he was sure that Fagenbaum was Jack the Ripper. So this guy didn't even admit to it. There's nothing really similar. Just the lawyer said awesome. it. Lawton said that Fagenbaum hated women, and he had a desire to kill and mutilate them. No one took this claim seriously until 2005, when former British policeman and author Trevor Marriott used Lawton's claims against his client as a basis to investigate further. In Marriott's book, Jack the Ripper, The 21st Century Investigation, he spends three chapters looking into Fagenbaum. He says Fagenbaum could have been a, could have been on a German ship, Reher, that was in port at the time of the Ripper murders. He also claims that he found other unsolved murders that Fagenbaum could have committed around the world. One in Germany, one in Switzerland, five in Nicaragua, and another few in the U.S. All the murders he found were Ripper-esque, but not quite Ripper, they're just throat slit many people have torn apart marriott's theory so bad that some of the murders of marriott claimed fagenbaum committed were found out didn't even happen like this guy just made up murders um to, mm. to to fit his theory and the murders that were proven did happen were sensationalized by marriott big time to fit his narrative cool story though sorry i'm just trying to see how long until we're done this because i wasted too much time fucking talking about how i feel bad for rj <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I made it worse for myself. <sighs> no, I love that. I love the I love the while trying to, you know, midway through apologize for taking too long, you take longer. That's my favorite. That's and that's why you have to leave it in because <laughs> uh, All right, Charles Ludwig Dodgson. Here's our celebrity connection in 1996. Author Richard Wallace released a book entitled Jack the Ripper, Lighthearted Friend. In it, Wallace suggests that Charles Dodgson, more famously known by his pen name as Lewis Carroll, author of Through the Looking Glass and other classic novels, uh, and his colleague Thomas Veer Bain were actually Jack the Ripper. This theory is based entirely on the fact that Lewis Carroll used to like anagrams. <laughs> Carroll admitted that he used to sneak hidden messages into his correspondence and publish works that provided insight into his state of mind. Knowing this, Wallace would try to anagram many of Carroll's work. Wallace then suggests that the books that Carroll were, were writing at the time of the Ripper murders were actually anagrams for admitting to the murder. So like the nursery version of Alice in Wonderland or like the, the kid version of Alice in Wonderland that he was writing. And the first volume of Sylvie and Bruno were just both anagrams describing the murders. So here's a few examples of what Wallace is suggesting for fun. So from the, Al the nursery of Alice in Wonderland. So we went back to the cook and we got her make saucer fun of nice oatmeal porridge. And then we called Dash into the house and we said, now Dash, you're going to uh, have your birthday treat. 
We expected Dash to jump for joy, but it didn't one bit. That's the little clip. Richard Wallace is done with it, his anagramming. At this passage, it reads, Oh, we, Thomas Bain, Charles Dodgson, coined into slain. Nude body, expected to taste, devour, enjoy a nice meal of a dead. Whore's uterus, we made do, found it awful wan, and thought like a worn, dirty goat hog, we both threw it out. Dash Jack the Ripper. Like awful one's not even a word. That's one word. Awful one. Here's a here's another fun example. Uh, the opening of Jabberwocky. Twas Brillig. Okay, remember the Jabber Jabberwocky is a made up word, and Lewis Carroll made up a shit ton of words in Alice in Wonderland. Okay, just remember that. Twas Brillig, and the Slithy Loves did gyre and gamble in the wake. All mums were of borough groves, and more rates outgrabe. That's the end of that. Outgrabe. Wallace's anagram. Bet I beat my glands till with hand sword I slay the evil gender, a slimy theme, borrow gloves, and masturbate the hog more. So, like, Carol just made up a bunch of words. So, you don't think he made, would have made better words up that would fit his anagram if that's what he was doing? Like, he would have just made up any word that would have fit his anagram so it doesn't sound stupid. Plus, Wallace cheated many times throughout his entire book, leaving out or changing letters he couldn't fit in. And people tore into Richard Wallace for the anagram theory. So when Jack the Ripper, a lighthearted friend, was referenced in Harper's Magazine, two anagram aficionados and readers of the magazine pointed out something to Richard Wallace. They took the first three sentences in Wallace's book, which are, this is my story of Jack the Ripper, the man behind Britain's worst unsolved murders. It is a story that points to the unlikeliest of suspects, a man who wrote children's stories. The man is Charles Dodson, better known as Lewis Carroll, authors of such books as Alice in Wonderland. They made it into their anagram, which was this, the, these anagram aficionados. The truth is this. I, Richard Wallace, stabbed and killed a muted Nicole Brown in cold blood, severing her throat with my trusty shiv strokes. I set up Orenthal James Simpson, who is utterly innocent of this murder. P.S. I also wrote Shakespeare's sonnets and a lot of Francis Bacon's work, too. <laughs> So they just fucking, Dope. <laughs> they just trolled the fuck out of them. Uh, That's pretty good. R Richard Wallace never responded. Not once. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Wallace never put up any type of hard evidence to back his theory in the least. Uh, this is probably the dumbest of the theories. <laughs> James Kelly is another one of the, uh, one, one of them. James Kelly was an upholsterer from Whitechapel during that time. And he, when the killings happened, he had just escaped from the Broadmoor Asylum. Uh, in 1883, James Kelly killed his wife with a penknife. Kelly killed her because his wife found out that he had venereal disease. She didn't know anything about sex. Damn. Yep. She didn't know anything about sex because she was apparently a virgin. So up until this point, she thought she was the problem because James just kept telling her that he would have sex with her, but your pussy's got a deformity. So I don't want to. Meanwhile, <laughs> that's what he would tell her. Meanwhile, he's upstairs injecting like Dr. Dumbledee's whatever shit into his dick. That's awesome. What if it was just because it wasn't a penis? It was a it was a vagina. He's like, no, it's deformed. It doesn't doesn't get me hard. It's all inside out and disgusting. <laughs> so when she figures out like, oh, wait, my pussy's not fucked up. It must be him. She confronts him and he loses it, repeatedly stabs her in the throat with a pen knife, calling her a prostitute. Oh, yeah. Don't ever don't ever confront your crazy sex obsessed husband about anything. No. Uh, James Claire, uh, Kelly is declared insane and remanded to Broadmoor indefinitely. After police hear about James Kelly escaping Broadmoor, they're on the lookout for him. Mostly Kelly is running from the uh, from the law the whole time. Police never find him. I'm assuming that he didn't do any of these murders, but who knows? Uh, James Kelly, here's the funny part about James Kelly. James Kelly returns to Broadmoor on April 22nd, 1922, after 40 years of being escaped. Uh, he's deaf. He was poor. He had shitty health and he was about to die. So when he shows up at the door, he said, um, I escaped 40 years ago. I want to come back and die with my friends, please. <laughs> So they let him back in and he dies two years later. Incredible. The reason he's a suspect is he's crazy enough to kill, crazy enough to kill with a knife. He's known for fits of rage. He got syphilis from prostitutes or so revenge. His escape from prison lines up pretty well with when the first killing started. Problem is, is that all the evidence doesn't point to him. You know what I mean? Like he's just mentally ill and he escaped. That's what they, the people were looking for was some, a crazy a lunatic who escaped from a lunatic asylum. Jill the Ripper. 
the female suspect. Jill the Ripper. The female suspect. This is for the Jack the Ripper feminists. All right. Even a, a woman could kill in a brutal fashion. It's not just for men anymore. All right. This is this is the one for Rick. Shout out to our, our feminist <laughs> king, Rick Getz. He thinks that women can uh, can be into prostitutes too. They can also be into serial murder of women as well. Yeah, if you, you're a woman and you've killed before, <laughs> drop, sound off in the comments about the best way to kill another woman or man. Uh, the reason they think there's a woman involved with any of this is because Australian scientists swabbed the stamps in the early 2006, May 2006, for DNA. And they found that some of the DNA from some of the, the Ripper letters came from a woman. So I know letters basically been debunked by Ripperologists as not being from the actual killer, but there's maybe they're wrong and it is from the killer. So Arthur Conan Doyle actually suggested this. He speculated at the time that Jack was probably a woman. A woman could have pretended to be a midwife or could have been a midwife and they would have been able to get away with being bloody walking around Whitechapel at the time. The theories expanded in 1939 by William Stewart in his book, Jack the Ripper, A New Theory, pointing out Mary Piercy as a suspect. Mary Piercy uh, was actually a girl named Mary Eleanor Wheeler. She took the Piercy from John Charles Piercy, a carpenter who she lived with. I don't think they were married, but John Piercy left her because she was cheating on him. So Mary Piercy then started to hang around a guy named Frank Hogg. Frank Hogg. Nice. Had, yeah, Frank Hogg had two girlfriends. One of them was Mary and the other was uh, a lady named Phoebe Styles. He's got to share the hog around, baby. That's right, baby. Share that hog. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part was the like repeating back. In, uh, you guys, you guys got something going. And I'm glad I'm not a part of it. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like what someone who's jealous would say. That's yep. it. Styles got pregnant and Frank makes a hog out of Phoebe after marriage. They named their kid Phoebe. So they're after her mother. So like Phoebe Hogg Jr., which I find fucking weird. Awesome. There's two Phoebe Hogs in the household. <laughs> On October 1890, Mary Piercy was called to the Hogg residence by Phoebe Hogg Sr. Not long after the invite, neighbors reported hearing screaming and sounds of violence in the house. Later that night, Phoebe's body was on a pile of trash outside. Her skull had been crushed. Her head was just barely hanging on at the neck. The baby yeah. was found dead a couple neighborhoods over in a baby carriage after being smothered. Mary Piercy had been seen pushing a baby carriage out near where the dead baby was found. The police searched her house and there was blood on the walls, floor and ceiling. They found a blood and hair covered fireplace poker and carving knife. When she was questioned about the blood, she told the police that she was just killing mice. That's why there's blood everywhere. As one does. <laughs> you ever seen mice blood? It looks suspiciously like baby brains. <laughs> she was sentenced to death for these two particularly cruel murders. Uh, Piercy did claim innocence for those murders. She was just killing mice. But her final words before execution were, my sentence is a just one, but a good deal of evidence against me was false. Did she feel like she deserved to die for other things she did? Are you guilty, Jill? One last thing I saw about uh, Mary Piercy was that she took out an ad in a Spanish newspaper that read M-E-C-P, last wish of Mew, have not betrayed. So like Mew is her real initials, M-E-W, but M-E-C-P is the if you want to get right into fucking craziness. From, it's the first letter of four of the Ripper victims. First letter of the name of four of the Ripper victims. But no one's actually ever figured out why she actually put that into that Spanish newspaper. But if that's the case, it suggests that Pearson was working with an accomplice or something because she was in jail when that fucking ad was taken out. So Jill the Ripper is probably not. It's just they found a fucking brutal murder woman from back then and dumped it onto her, which they've done about four times so far. So those are the fucking stupid suspects the ones that are dumb. The other ones, they have all have a lot like the next episode will have the ones that are more they actually fit in they line up more with what actually happened and they make a lot more sense so we'll get go through them i can't like i said i can't go through all 200 of them sorry for people who like to hear this shit but i thought we were going through all 200 of them yeah i i counted like 194 i feel like <laughs> we just we're just shy <laughs> that was like eight <laughs> i don't know there was a couple like bonus there's a couple bonus suspects in a couple of those stories if we upset even one person who calls themselves a ripperologist i will consider this a success 
yeah okay so we'll come back next week i'll give you guys some more uh, details on this fucking uh, douchebag huh Woo. i just watch private dicks and i think rj's the funniest what come on hey there all you private dickheads that's probably not the name we're gonna stick with anyways uh, rj here i am here to tell you Thank you for listening to another episode of Private Dicks. If you liked what you heard, go on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere they take your reviews, drop us five stars, say something nice. Also, what you just heard was from last season. If you want current episodes as they're dropped, head on over to patreon.com and search up Unethical Podcast. That's our mother podcast. I was not aware Private Dicks was a spinoff. I'm going to renegotiate my contract. On Patreon is a full 16-episode season more of Private Dicks, uncut videos of each episode, and many more things are getting added all the time. You can also find all of Unethical's content on there, so go listen to that. And, if you're already a patron, fuck yeah, dude. You're the best.